Hello YouTube, this is Sheldon the Destroyer and we're going to learn about the fizzy world of soft drinks today! So we're gonna watch Modern Marvels. Um, it is uh, season 15, episode 13. Um, but yeah, if you wanna hang out with me on life, I stream on Twitch five days a week most weeks and Wednesdays and Thursdays are my watch along days and if you would like to help me grow I appreciate you. Please do some algorithmic interaction with me such as like, comment and subscribing down below. Let Grab your snackies, grab your bevies, let me know what you're eating, what you're drinking and let's get to learning about bevies specifically the soft drink variety They're the products of a multi-billion dollar industry yeah, they are. It started out making cures for what ailed you. For worms? And micro -brew. We're the only people commercially who brew a I'm drinking a Coke that now. Away. That's our claim to fame. A tiny seed gives some of them more than twice the caffeine boost of a cup of coffee. While the key to formulating others is sending sweat through a centrifuge. Ew. It's time to twist your top, pour a glass, and chill out. Slurpy. Soft drinks on Modern Marvels. Yeah! Let's learn! <laughs> Nearly 15 billion gallons. Quick, quick, quick. What's everyone's favorite soft drink? Sorry, I'm still eating my chicken nuggets. My favorite's Coca-Cola. Dr. Pepper, nice, nice. Everyone likes Dr. Pepper. My favorite's Coca-Cola. I also like a good grape coke, but you can only get that in Alabama, so. Gallons of soft drinks quench the thirsts of Americans each year. That's nearly the combined volume of coffee, beer, and bottled water consumed annually in the U.S. IBZ! Flavors, eye catching containers, and claims of invigoration continually entice us to gulp away. What exactly are soft drinks? Simply put, they're non alcoholic liquid refreshments. But it's not quite mm. that simple. Are coffees and teas soft drinks? No. No, they're not fizzy. Water? Nope. It's not fizzy. Milk? Ditto. It's not fizzy. How about fruit juices? Maybe to some, but we'll save those for another show. I think in the United States, people tend to think of a soft drink more in the carbonated sense, so carbonated yeah. soft drinks. Uh, but in reality, it's broader than that. The carbonated soft drink category is far and away the largest beverage category in the U.S. People drink more carbonated soft drinks than any other beverage. U.S. soda makers produce enough carbonated soft drinks to supply each American with more than 50 gallons per year. It's old news that the top two companies are Coca-Cola and Pepsi. With brands and logos known worldwide. But number three, with 18% of the market... Dr. Pepper. That's the Dr. Pepper Snapple Group. It bottles six of the top ten non-cola carbonated soft drinks. Dr. Pepper, 7-Up, Sunkiss, Canada Dry, a and W N Squirt? What is squirt? Also, I, I feel like I didn't realize that 7-Up was its own thing. Or Sunkiss. I thought, thought Sunkiss was under Pepsi. Maybe I have heard of Squirt and just forgot about it. Because I don't drink it. Led naturally by Dr. Pepper. Its signature taste is actually a blend of a multiplicity of flavors. Multiplicity. There's 23 flavors which has made it more unique than most soft drinks. It doesn't have kind of a easily identifiable flavor. It is truly a flavored drink that is unlike colas and unlike a specific flavor like an orange or a grape. But what are those 23 flavors? Not allowed to share the 23 flavors. I was about to say, that's a, a secret. Closely held secret. We actually have it locked in a vault in our headquarters in Plano, Texas. I think maybe seven people actually know what all the 23 flavors are. There is one thing the company is willing to share with us. 
how its plant in Irving, Texas, produces approximately 70 million cases of soft drinks a year. Mm. That's enough soft drinks to fill more than 250 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Sticky. The Irving Manufacturing Facility is the largest in the Dr. Pepper Snapple Group system. It is one of 24 plants. It's approximately 1 million square feet. 300 manufactured boys run the facility. That's loud. The soda making process starts with the main ingredient, comprising 99% of every soft drink. What a... The heart of any soft drink manufacturing facility is water. We use a lot of it, upwards of a million gallons a day. Carbon filter towers, reverse osmosis units, and UV disinfection rays decontaminate and purify the water before the next key ingredient is added. The stuff that gives soft drinks their sweet flavor and caffeinated ones their kick, the syrup. We're here at syrup room number one today where we're gonna produce Canada Dry Ginger Ale Syrup. In syrup preparation, we combine concentrate, sweetener, and treated water. The all important sweetener in the mix isn't the sugar you use at home. It's high fructose corn syrup 55, or HFCS 55. Sucrose or table sugar is 50. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they said that and I was like, what's what's high fructose corn syrup anyway? But they're gonna explain it. <laughs> percent fructose, a simple sugar found in fruits, and 50% glucose, an energy supplying simple sugar, essential for human metabolism. Mm -hmm. HFCS 55 is 55% fructose and 45% glucose. Okay. The corn-based sweetener has some advantages over sugar for soft drink makers. Like what? High fructose corn syrup, or HFCS, uh, became industry standard as a sweetener in the uh, mid-80s and allows us to produce more and you know, do it at a relatively good price for consumers. Because I'm out of the combination of syrup and water to the filling room. Okay, I'm done with this. Where awaits an instant injection of the gas that puts the fizz in our soda. Carbon dioxide. at a five to one ratio. Right now we're running approximately 60 gallons a minute of water and approximately 12 gallons a minute of syrup. We carbonate it 35 degrees to ensure the CO2 gets into solution. 35 degrees Fahrenheit, huh? temperatures would cause the bubbles to dissipate okay. and make the soda go flat. Mm. The process at the filling stations help preserve the fizz as the soda is injected into cans or bottles that are then rapidly sealed. Sweet, busy beverages like these have become an iconic part of the cultural landscape. <laughs> Carbonated soft drinks are a huge part of American culture and much more popular here than a lot of markets around the world. There's a lot of heat. Uh, it's almost like a... Uh... We're not the healthiest market. History steeped in tradition. History's earliest mentions of carbonated liquids can be traced to the ancient Greeks and Romans. They prized natural mineral water for its health benefits, but mm. they didn't drink it. They bathed in it. Europeans revived that tradition in the 18th and 19th centuries, <laughs> except they also started bottling and imbibing it. Commercial. I um. If I wasn't so, like, okay, this is entirely off the subject. But on the subject of like bathhouses, kind of, because they just showed us that, right? Um, I wouldn't. I'm not opposed to like public bathhouses. I it, the idea of it, right? Except I feel like in America it would be horrific, right? <laughs> um. Because, like, the whole idea is you're supposed to completely clean yourself before you get into the bath. Like, you're supposed to shower and clean yourself, and then you get into the bath and relax while you're clean. And I just don't, pe I just don't believe people do that in America. Um, I, I believe people just kind of hang out in the soup of their own dirt. Which, no, thank you. But, uh... I, man, I want like a, I want like a spa kind of go hang out. I'd be like, hey friends. I mean, 
I say that I, I have gone to like a Korean bathhouse <laughs> with some friends. Um, but it's like, let's go, let's go hang out in like the warm water. <laughs> really, I just want a heated pool. I'm gonna be honest. The carbonated soft drink tradition as we know it began in the late 19th century. Most brands originated as the elixirs of pharmacists at neighborhood drugstores. They were marketed not only as refreshments, but cure-alls. You know, uh, back to the subject of bathhouses. Um, it was definitely like a, it was gender split. So like there was a male side and a female side. And at first I was like really like shy about it. And then I kept having to like go back to where my stuff was because I was like, oh, I forgot to take off my necklace or I forgot to take off my ring or I forgot to take off this. And after a while, I was like, so I would be like, oh, I, I need a cover. But you're not aware, allowed to wear coverings and like the the showers and stuff, right? Because you're supposed to be cleaning yourself. And um, it, it was a sauna and they had like a bath thing in there. But like, so you couldn't wear anything in the in the showers in the bath area. Um. So after a while, I was like, you know what? Everyone here is naked. And there's people I don't know here that I'm never going to see in, again in my entire life. What do I care? Like, I got the same stuff everybody else got. Like, who cares? Like, that, that's how I felt about it. So all the girls were together. And after a while, we were just like, fuck it. Who cares? Um, because that ends up happening with a lot of my girlfriends. Because a lot of us are in are in cosplay and so like sometimes you need help getting into cosplay and you just need someone to kind of get up in your business to help you get into that cosplay and then some of my friends were like in theater and like they'll be like theater don't care and so <laughs> that you know it was just like whatever and then we found out later that the guys went in one at a time so they weren't in there together <laughs> so that's the difference the girls clump together for safety <laughs> and assurance and the guys go in individually <laughs> so that's pretty funny i gotta go to arkansas for that no thanks <laughs> i've never actually been to arkansas <laughs> dr pepper led the way it was introduced in 1885 um, in waco texas uh, doc alderton invented it in uh, morrison's corner drugstore and really it gained world popularity in 1904 at the World's Fair in St. Louis, along with the hot dog that was being introduced at the same time. I've been eating hot dogs lately. I've been getting like the, okay, I'm sorry, I came in or I I'm so sorry about things that are not fizzy related. Um, I get all, like all beef hot dogs and usually I like fillet them open, which sounds crazy. And I like pan fry them on my like uh, cast iron skillet and they're they're really tasty. Um, I got lazy and so I just started boiling them and like chopping them up and like I eat them like a sandwich when I do that right but I got lazy and I just started like boiling them and like chopping them up and like dipping them into ketchup and eating with rice they're so good y'all we have hot dogs man it came along in 1886 when Atlanta That's Georgia me. pharmacist Dr. John Pemberton produced its first syrup Carbonated water was added to the soda fountain. And the tonic sold for five There's cents still less. somewhere that... Sales that first year averaged... There's still somewhere that does Coca-Cola like that. Like, they, they pump the syrup in the glass and then they add carbonated water and they mix it. I don't remember where it is, but somewhere does that still. Nine drinks per day. You may have heard the story about Coca-Cola's original recipe containing coca leaves, the plant from which cocaine is derived. Mm. The stimulating leaf was thought to be a remedy for various ailments. Hold on, I gotta blow my nose. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna mute myself for a second. I'm so sorry. Okay. I, you know, I haven't as many freaking times as I have been in downtown Atlanta. 
literally right beside the world of Coca-Cola. I have yet to go through the world of Coca-Cola, which is wild because I love Coke. A cola. <laughs> it's my favorite soft drink. It's it's wild. But also, I'm the type of person that doesn't want to do anything, but I do want to go to zoos and aquariums. So every time I'm there, I'm like, aquarium, because it's like right beside it. So I always just go to the aquarium. And it's like, you want to go to the world of Coke? I want to spend all day in the aquarium. <laughs> After continuous public outcry over the dangers of the drug, the cola maker quietly removed it from its recipe in the early 1900s. The signature ingredient in Pepsi, which debuted in 1893, was also the inspiration for the cola's name, pepsin, an enzyme that aids with digestion. But initially it was dubbed Brad's drink, after the pharmacist who invented it. I have definitely not been to the College Hall of Fame either. Because there's a big aquarium right there. And I don't care how many times I go to that aquarium. I want to go back. So. Caleb Bradham. Today, Dr. Pepper has its loyal following. But Coke and Pepsi continue to dominate the industry. One of the reasons Coke and Pepsi are so successful is because they have uh, cola brands. Colas are more than half of the carbonated soft drink, that flavor component. Uh, Americans love colas. And so those two brands have kind of slugged it out for dominance in the carbonated soft drink category. But there's more at stake in the soft drink industry than this long-running rivalry. Many health-conscious consumers are turning their backs on popular brands which may contain artificial flavors, colors, and preservatives. Hansen's natural sodas made the colors make it Angeles, taste better. are among the brands offering an alternative. In 2006 and in 2007, we saw about a 2% decline in overall mainstream soda sales. But during that same time, natural sodas like Hansen's natural soda actually showed an increase in grocery store sales of about 18 to 20% a year. It's really the moms who started the trend towards natural sodas. So they were starting to really be concerned about preservatives and artificial colors, artificial flavors. The Hansen's natural soda would be made with a natural flavor. And a natural flavor is actually derived from the essence that is extracted from the actual fruit, as opposed to an artificial flavor, which is a chemically synthesized compound. For example, the Hansen's mandarin lime natural flavor would actually have essences derived from Yucatan mandarins and Colima limes, as opposed to, say, an orange soda that's made with an artificial flavor. Until 2008, Hansen's natural sodas contain the same crucial sweetener. It's I mean, they started off at, like, a Coke, uh, Dr. Pepper place, but it's probably because... So, so why is the chip place that did all of the things in the first episode we watched last week. They're actually a, a big brand. Like, they do sell, uh, like, at my local grocery store, which is, like, a small grocery store um, chain. Relatively small. It's SE Grocery. But, like, um, so they are actually a big brand. You, you see them more often than you think, but in stores, not as opposed to in like ballparks and stuff, you know? Um, so all these brands are kind of bigger than you think, but they also, like, Coca-Cola doesn't want you in its business. Like, that's kind of why. Coca-Cola doesn't want to show you what's going on there because maybe they have some stuff that they don't want like their competitors knowing about or something like that where these small companies they're like yeah sure whatever let's let's this benefits us to help get our name out there more by being on an episode because like oh people watch this show it doesn't hurt us it's basically just advertisement for us like yeah sure come on Coca-Cola doesn't need that advertising neither does Pepsi they have huge advertising budgets. Their, their names are everywhere. That makes sense. Coke, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, and most popular brands. Yeah. High fructose corn syrup. 
The scientific jury is still out concerning whether HFCS contributes to obesity more than pure cane sugar. But Hansen's decided to make the change to sugar based on appeals from its customers. For us, it's all about reacting to what the consumers and the retailers have asked us to do. The main piece of equipment Hansen's required to make the switch was this liquid sucrose holding tank. Two to three times a day, the sugar supplier fills the tank with 5,000 gallons. It's just one of Hansen's ingredients on a short list. Rather than have maybe 40 different ingredients like red dye number 40, sodium benzoate, potassium sorbate, Hansen's natural soda just has these four ingredients, triple filtered purified water, cane sugar, citric acid, and pure fruit flavor extract. But the key ingredient in the fastest growing niche of the soft drink market is caffeine. Yeah. And one can might contain more caffeine than a cup of coffee. I can't drink energy drinks. They're not tasty. They taste like battery acid. Soft drinks are designed to quench our thirst, satisfy our sweet tooth, and since the introduction of sports drinks in 1965, refuel our bodies. For decades, top athletes, including two-time Olympic beach volleyball gold medalists Kerry Walsh and Misty May Trainer, have allied themselves with a sports drink leader, Gatorade. Gatorade's fine. And they're even willing to donate their sweat to Gatorade scientists using these special patches. Whether in a real-world environment like this, or here, at the Gatorade Sports Science Institute outside Chicago. The serious business of sports drink. Yeah, Gatorade's really serious about being like top dog in like sports drinks and fucking staying there. Like, they, they put a lot of, they actually put a lot of money into like scientific shit. And um, apparently that comes down to like taking sweat samples and experimenting on them. I don't know research sweats the details this rapidly growing sector of the soft drink market accounts for nearly three percent of all beverages purchased in the u.s and gatorade has been number one <laughs> since the beginning gatorade is the biggest sports drink brand in the united states accounts for about 80 percent of the sports drink market Powerade would be the second biggest brand, probably about 15 or 16 percent of the market. And when you add those two together, that doesn't leave much room for anybody else. In its effort to stay on top, Gatorade has made a science of the task of replenishing what the body loses during physical activity. The Gatorade Sports Science Institute is responsible for showing that Gatorade works. Didn't Powerade get bought out by Gatorade, though? Aren't they the same company now? I could be wrong but I thought they were owned by the same people now. Looking at it in different situations, we're here to take a look at how we can help the athlete in terms of what they need to put into their body to stay hydrated. To stay hydrated, the body needs to replace electrolytes lost through sweating. Electrolytes are charged minerals, sodium, potassium, and chloride that are in our muscle and nerve cells. Powerade is Coca-Cola. That makes sense. I thought it was, I was like, it's owned by something. And they help transport. Oh, you know what? I'm thinking about, was it Propel? Maybe I'm thinking about Propel. Electrical activity from the brain to the muscle and stimulate the muscle to contract so you can exert the force and move or kick the ball, whatever you want to do in terms of sports and activity. Collecting sweat enables Gatorade scientists to measure an athlete's electrolyte depletion. This will help them determine the right amount of electrolytes to put into their various Gatorade formulas. The idea of these sweat tests is for the athlete to work out at the intensity that they would typically do either in training or competition. Your Why the red light? changes with intensity, air temperature, your fitness okay, it's level, the about. amount of clothing you're wearing. So when an athlete comes into our lab, we try to control all those factors and make them as similar to their training or competition as possible. 
This could not be me. I'm not an athlete. Could not do this. Once the patches become saturated with sweat, researchers take them for a spin in a centrifuge. And it's this spinning that actually extracts the fluid from these patches. Mm -hmm. And it's that fluid that we measure to determine electrolyte concentration. Mm. So now that our spinning is complete, what we get is the sweat that we use. Look, this will tell us exactly how much sodium and potassium is in the athlete's sweat. <laughs> We're learning! The other thing the body needs to keep moving is carbohydrates. They're the second key ingredient in Gatorade. Carbohydrates are the primary fuel the body uses. The more intense you exercise, the more your body relies exclusively on carbohydrate. This concoction of carbs and electrolytes traces its origins to the mid-1960s. The brainchild of University of Florida researchers led by Dr. Robert Cade. Mm. Their first test subjects, the Florida Gators football team. Football players are having problems with heat stress. The medical professors at the university uh, approached the team about developing something that would help them withstand the, the stress, the dehydration, and fatigue. And so they concocted this formula for Gatorade. After they started guzzling Gatorade on the sidelines, the Gators went from a 7-4 record in 1965 to an Orange Bowl championship two years later. Many credited Gatorade with improving the team's overall endurance. Another type of soft drink that appeals to those Air Force. a stimulating boost is the energy drink. Energy drinks may contain up to 80 milligrams or more of caffeine, about as much as a cup of coffee, and double that of some sodas. Most brands also include Guarana, a South American plant. Guarana? That's how you say that? Okay, so have you guys ever had, like, Balls energy drinks? They used to come in, like, glass bottles. You used to be able to get them at Target. I used to drink those. Those were like the only ones that I kind of like liked the taste of. I would get so angry. Like I would get enraged after I drank one. Like I would just go, I would just be mad. So I had to stop drinking them. <laughs> Cause I guess like I'd had too much caffeine or something. I don't know, it just made me mad. I would just get mad, like super angry all the time. It was weird. Plant <laughs> with seeds that contain up to three times the amount of caffeine. Get okay, all right. And a synthetic version of taurine, a natural amino acid that assists with digestion. Hmm. Energy drinks are a recent phenomenon. It's a category that's only about 10 years old, coming into the U.S. marketplace in the mid 90s, and continuing today, where the category has had immense growth, about 500 percent over the last five years. Pass. In 2007, U.S. energy drink sales reached more than $7 billion. Mm -hmm. An increasing percentage of those sales come from places like Temple, a San Francisco nightclub, okay. where crowds line up for a night of mingling, dancing, and drinking. I think that energy <laughs> drinks, if they are Woo! really successful, they almost have to be introduced in a nightclub or bar setting. And then for this gentleman here, It gives them the opportunity to expose their product to a lot of people who then might later, when they go to the grocery store, see that product that they were served in the nightclub that they like, and then they're more likely to buy it. Nightclub and bar sales really drive the retail sales. Hmm. One brand of energy drinks partnering with Temple is Jet Set, a company hoping to establish itself in the industry. While Jet Set provides consumers with a... You know where else you can do? go to a campus and just hand it out for free. College kids will try it. You give them something free? Like, just saying. Standard fruity flavored energy drink. It also offers classic mixers with a contemporary kick. We make a club soda, 
a tonic water and a ginger ale that all can be mixed with whatever spirit oh that's prefer. smart especially if you're going to use it go to a bar enjoy drinking gin and tonics so you can have a gin and jet set tonic and it gives you that same functional kick that a red bull would give you but it's a traditional mixed drink when do they get those footage but combining alcohol which is a depressant with a stimulant like caffeine can send mixed messages to the nervous system and possibly cause cardiac related problems it gives me heartburn <laughs> not saying i don't do it but it does Energy drinks, when you mix them with alcohol, do give the person who's consuming them a little bit of a false sense of alertness, of being fine, and perhaps feeling more sober than they actually are. And it might cause them to continue drinking when maybe they shouldn't. But adding caffeinated beverages to alcohol is nothing new. Here's no, like whiskey and coke. the century, during the Spanish-American War, American soldiers took what was then a new beverage, coke, to Cuba where they and others that followed added rum to make a cocktail that's still popular yeah. today. The key to mixing rum energy and drinks Coke. and alcohol is not to have too much of either. You shouldn't have too much alcohol and you shouldn't have too much of an energy drink. And you need to realize that too much of either one of them are gonna, are gonna potentially be harmful. As energy drinks in the bar scene continue to raise concerns, this brewery makes a beer even a child could drink. Root beer! I don't really like root beer all that much. Like, I can drink it. I like, um, IBC contains equipment normally used in a glass beer. bottles, specifically. Don't smell any hops or barley here. I don't like Only barks. Ginger. It's got caffeine and it's weird. This is where Chris Reed makes his version of ginger ale. Using principles dating back more than oh, two centuries. Oh, it's ginger? This is where it starts. Our company makes ginger ale from real ginger. And I also don't like ginger ale. Because I don't like ginger. ginger. The average bottle will have anywhere from 8 grams to 25 grams of ginger. This batch here will be for about 700 cases and we'll use about 700 pounds. So we use approximately a pound per case. That's a lot of ginger. Fresh ginger, spices, and a whole lot of water go into this thousand gallon steam jacketed brewing kettle. Kettle. It's actually two kettles. On the outside of the inner kettle is steam, and that heats up the water. So we're actually boiling water in there, and we're throwing the roots right into the boiling water. Mm -hmm. Large rotating paddles mix the ginger-infused liquid. Once brewed, it's strained through a perforated false bottom, then piped into a separate kettle. Here, brewers mix in sweeteners and natural flavors. Honey, lemon, lime juice, pineapple juice. Chilled to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, the mixture marinates for a few days before reaching the final step in the brewing process. Marinates. Carbonation. Chris uses a centuries-old carbonation process, still used in the craft beer industry. A small micropore rod slowly feeds CO2 into the 1,800-gallon holding tank. A modern soda plant will run it in a split second in a very high-tech piece of equipment. This takes me 12 hours to carbonate, but it produces a very small champagne-like carbonation, which is mm. for the aficionado a superior carbonation. So when we're <laughs> done, this is like a huge bottle of soda. After pasteurization, 2,000 champagne-style bottles of ginger ale per hour are bottled, labeled, and boxed. So this is a very big version of the way it was made maybe in the 1800s or the 1700s. And of course, we're the only people commercially who brew a soda that old-fashioned way. That's our claim to fame. Before commercialization and high-tech carbonation, soft drinks were the products of home brewers. Before they had fancy bottling plants to uh, bottle it up and add carbonation, they would brew up their roots and then they would add a sugar to sweeten it, and then they would add yeast, and they would bottle it. The yeast is in the bottle, eating the sugar, is giving off CO2. So it's great huh. for carbonation, but it's also doing what it does in beer, which is produce alcohol. Huh. So your early soft drinks were slightly alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Well before brewers were making bubbles, ginger's medicinal properties were known and used. Ginger has a huge health history. 
the Greeks and the Romans known for their overeating habits. They would use ginger as the Alka-Seltzer. So it's quite a tradition of helping yeah, people with digestive just, problems. I just don't like ginger. I don't Another like the taste of it. medicinal properties comes from the sassafras tree. Sassafras! And eventually became the basis for another iconic soft drink, root beer. Root beer sassafras! Native Americans brewed its roots into their own brand of tonic. The root tonic was eventually commercialized in 1876 in Philadelphia, site of America's first world's fair. There, pharmacist Charles Hires introduced his blend of root spiced tea to the paying public. Root spiced tea, huh? Root beer became an increasingly popular soft drink flavor until 1960, when the FDA banned the use of root beer's key ingredient, sassafras, sassafras. labeling it a potential carcinogen. Gasp. The sassafras root that had all the health benefits had an oil called safrole. The problem Sa with safrole was that if they fed it to a rat in an experiment, it could get cancer. Maybe the cola guys were trying to get the root beer guys who were getting very popular and trying to derail them with this. That's, no one will know for sure. Okay. After the ban, most root beer makers began developing artificial flavors to match the distinct taste of sassafras. Today, a few companies, including Hansen's, uses safrole-free sassafras extract. Mm. How does the taste of Hansen's root beer stack up? It's not bad. I think it's going for the more generic it's root not beer bad. taste, but it, it's, it's tasty, very foamy. It's got a good creamy texture. That Works is well as a float. not that guy's favorite root beer flavor. Anthony Shore <laughs> has been reviewing root beer online since 1996. Yeah, it's not his favorite. He's among a growing number of root beer aficionados who enjoy exploring and savoring the nuances hey, of this unique soft drink. I've reviewed, I think it's 377 root beers, birch beers, <laughs> sarsaparillas. Just root beers, I think, is 250 something. For me, the, the root beer tasting, it's similar to uh, tasting a fine wine. This will be my first taste of this soda. He seems like not jazzed. Butterscotch root beer. See how that first taste is, that first sip. Oh, nice, DJ. Small head, but it's very creamy and sweet anyway. I like it. Rating wise, this might be a little overly sweet. Maybe uh, 81 out of my uh, scale of one to 100. What, what's the highest? Chris Reed is a root beer lover too. Topping his list is Virgil's, a company which Chris purchased from the previous owner in 1999. I mean, yeah. Since then, he's come up with his own unique recipe for micro brewed root beer. Like butterscotch? We're somewhere halfway between those really hard butter beers or beers butterscotch? And a commercial root beer. I think. We're using uh, nutmeg, and this is the whole nutmeg. Generally, it's ground. Then we use cloves, the star anise, that comes from uh, Spain. We use the cinnamon sticks. Uh, cinnamon comes uh, originally from Salon. We also use the vanilla beans. We like to use the Madagascar vanilla beans. Licorice comes from France. And then wintergreen, very large part of root beer. Almost every root beer has it in America. Molasses, it's a sweetener, but it has a lot of health properties and it's a wonderful flavor too. Mm -hmm. When it comes to packaging, Virgil's tries to give the consumer a true root beer experience. Long neck bottles, a party keg. Party keg. And for those willing to pay a few right. extra bucks. We convinced a brewery in southern Germany to uh, make it with the uh, Grolsch swing lid. That's a porcelain swing top. And this is uh, probably, by aficionados, considered the ultimate root beer. Mm -hmm. Whether it's his own ginger brew or Virgil's, Chris has one simple rule when consuming his beverages. Do you serve them over ice? Absolutely not. <laughs> they were built perfectly the way they were. They're not to be diluted with ice. So it's uh, for us, when we serve up these sodas, we do it with attitude. That's funny. <laughs> for one major soft drink outlet, it's not attitude that seems to matter, but size. Oh, 7 Eleven. And loosen your belt. I don't the think. Month of the year. 
I don't drink Slurpees. I also don't have a 7-Eleven nearby me. Um, I have, I like Icy's, um, which are, you know, still frozen. I like specifically the Coke flavor. I don't like, like, strawberry or cherry or, or blue whatever. I like, <laughs> I always just get Coke Icy's. The 11th day of the month. What's your favorite flavor? To celebrate its birthday. There might not be. My I have no idea. Public, free of charge. It's signature soft drink. The Slurpee. This happens every year on 7-Eleven's birthday. We give free Slurpee to everybody all day long. The semi-frozen mixture of water, flavored syrup, and CO2 has filled more than six billion Slurpee cups since it hit 7-Eleven stores in 1965. Mm. That's enough Slurpee for nearly every person on the planet. Yeah, actually, this is my first Slurpee. Uh, we don't actually sell Slurpees or anything in England. Do they have like a grape flavor? I'd probably like grape flavor. As long as it's like purple flavor and not like actual grape. Um, so sometimes we give out high chews and <laughs> Hi Chews are a Japanese candy, and I grabbed one of their grape ones because I was like, I like grape candy, and I put it in my mouth, and I was like, what, this, no, this is wrong, and like the, <laughs> the packaging's purple, because I guess it's, it's grape. Usually a lot of packaging in Japan for grape flavored things, it's often, not always, it depends on what it is, but it's often the green grape. I put it in my mouth, and I was like, this isn't, this isn't purple flavored at all. And then I was like, this is, this is flavored like actual grapes. What is this? <laughs> is it only, you aren't even allowed to open a 7-Eleven in Alabama? Wild. Really good, really refreshing. The Slurpee is in a soft drink category all its own. I want to see the flavor names. In 1959. Kind of by accident. Slurpee began with a broken soda dispenser. The uh, gentleman who. Tropicana Twister, Tangerine Lime, Slurp something, Pomegranate. What? Y'all being. What? <laughs> On the store, couldn't serve any sodas, couldn't serve them warm, so they threw them in the freezer. Berry. Pomegranate? Pom Pomegranate, maybe? And when he served them, all of his customers love this kind of half-frozen icy treats. Six years later, 7-Eleven began selling a modified version of the beverage it originally called the Icy. Icy! After a few years, in 1967, they're sitting around drinking the drinks and noticed that it made this slurping sound. Mm. So there came the name Slurpee. I like Icy. The frozen flavors started with Coke, yeah! Cherry. Coke. Today, 20 different flavors are available, including energy Slurpees. Oh. Okay, so I could just go and get a Coke one. That's fine. I don't want a monster. Do you want frozen battery acid? Like, regular battery acid is not good enough. You want frozen? And sugar free. Sometimes. Hmm. We get customers where the mix and match flavors to give them the special taste. There you go, DJ. Mix and match. The core of no, thank you. Taste Hard pass. Is in the flavored syrup. Held in two and a half gallon boxes. The two and a half gallon bag in a box of syrup will make a little over 150. 20 God, I have gone to Burger King. So all my Burger Kings like are awful in the town that I live in. I don't know why. It, they're just bad. Um, but I will, I have absolutely gone specifically just to get an IC. Like, <laughs> I've gone through the Burger King drive to just be like, I would like a large Coke IC, thanks. <laughs> two ounce Slurpee drinks. The Slurpee syrup is a special formulation different than fountain syrup in that it has an ingredient which allows... That is not true. Not all Burger Kings are bad. If you go to a college campus food court and it's like a busy food court and they have a Burger King, that is a fire Burger King because they are constantly just going, 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 making food. I don't know. We used to have one. We no longer have one at the university. When I, was at, when I went to the university, we had one in the food court and it was 
so good. And then I would go to like standalone Burger Kings and they would be awful and I would be upset. Busy does not always mean good, but I don't know why the college campus ones were. Maybe it's because like you didn't buy drinks from them. Like you just walked up and you grabbed your food. Or if you had like a specific order like I did, because I don't like anything on my burgers, I would just be like, hey, could I just get a plain burger? So they'd have to make my burger. I'd have to ask for it as opposed to just walking up and grabbing like a Whopper. Um, that's what they have, right? Whopper. But like they didn't have dr most of my problems are like the food's not cooked enough at the other ones. And like their drinks always taste like cleaner. But like the the drinks there were like the si separate like you didn't buy drinks at that Burger King. You would order your Burger King. You would go to another section that were like all your drinks and you would get your drinks and then you would check out at this like general checkout because the burger there was like a burger king a chick-fil-a there was like a little pizza place there's like a bunch of different things right and then you would check out not at each individual like quote unquote food restaurant or food place because they were all like grab and go for the most part you would check out before you went and eat like if, if that makes sense it was such a good Burger King. And I was like, man, I like I like Burger King. And then anytime I go to a Burger King that is like a standalone Burger King, it's awful. Like, I don't... The, the fries are never cooked all the way. I don't know why. Usually I don't super have an issue with like my burger. My burgers are usually fine because again, I don't get anything on my burgers. Like I just get a hamburger that's plain. But like... Their drinks always taste like there's cleaner on the nozzles. And, like, I, I've worked at restaurants. I know how they clean things. <laughs> the lazy way, quote unquote, of cleaning things, which is generally at the end of the night. Like, you dilute cleaner in a bucket of water and you take off the nozzles and you just dip it in there. Like, you just drop it in the bucket and then you leave. And then the next day, you're supposed to take it out of the thing and you're supposed to rinse it. You're supposed to clean it. And then put it back, and I'm like, do, do they? Because it tastes like there's cleaner in this. And I'm like, that sucks. I'm like, I Burger King tastes good when it's fully cooked, and there's not what I think is cleaner in the, Like, I'm just like, I'm mad about it anyway. allows the CO2 carbon dioxide to actually be absorbed into the drink. That's why also, so I used to have a... There's a gas station kind of at the end of my street leaving my neighborhood. And um, it got bought out by another gas station chain. And now when I go in there, their icy machine is always like not really working. And they don't sell Milo's sweet tea anymore. I'm just like, I hate this. But I used to like would go and at least get like a small... At least a small. Sometimes I'll get, like, you know, medium or large. But, like, I would go. It's like, oh, I'm about to be on a road trip. I got to get gas. I'll get gas here. And I'll get an icy. But now I can't do that because it's never, it's never working. And I'm mad. Burpee has that very smooth texture. The foaming agent is called yucca. Yucca. A compressor pumps the syrup, water, and CO2 out to the dispenser. Where sub-freezing temperatures give the Slurpee its trademark consistency. I like the noise it makes. The syrup allows the product to be poured <sighs> at a temperature of 24 to 28 degrees that looks wet. in a semi-frozen state. Without that, it would freeze rock solid. Inside the Slurpee dispenser, water, syrup, and CO2 mix together. Then go into each of the machine's chilled aluminum barrels. Each barrel holds 176 ounces of finished product. The brains of the equipment are behind these panels, which are constantly monitoring what's going on with the product in the barrel. Peter, 910%. The computer monitors the resistance of each barrel's mixing bar. As the Slurpee freezes, resistance increases. When it gets to that ideal point, the compressor will turn off the product then will start to melt down ever so slightly. The whole key is that when that customer walks up to the machine,
that product in the barrel is ready to pour that perfect Slurpee. Okay. Slurpees, of course, aren't the only soft drinks available at 7-Eleven. A variety of sodas are available by the Gulf. Mm -hmm. In 1973, 7-Eleven launched its first Gulp fountain program with two sizes, which was a 12 and a 20 ounce size Gulp. In 1976, 7-Eleven launched the 32 ounce Big Gulp and had tremendous success and found that its fountain business- 59 cents. Over the years, 7-Eleven has offered its customers Super. a by popping serving Double. that redefined our sense of indulgence. Yeah, the calm down. In 1984, the 44-ounce Super Big Gulp came in a tapered version for the traveling soda drink. Super Big Gulp. I mean, I wouldn't hate it. Again, I travel a lot, so, like, I definitely go on, like, you know, three to four hour one way and then trips. So, like, I, I get it, but, like. I also go to Whataburger and they have giant soda. I can't say anything. <laughs> I think you told me how to pronounce your name before. Uh, Holiger? I'm sorry, one more time, please. Holden was playing my stream clips? Who's Holden? Hi, though. We're learning about sodas. <laughs> Holding these nuts. <laughs> Valid. <laughs> 88 introduced the 64 ounce double gulp, which had twice the calories of the original gulp. I do drink uh, Coke 64 ounces once a day. Kind of the piece Bruh. of resistance, the official team gulp, which is about team gulp. Ounces. Jesus. Size okay. Is fancy, 7 Eleven made filling up on soft drinks a lot easier. By introducing its self-serve fountains in 1978. But today, soda fans can still be served classic soda okay, drinks mixed was, the old-fashioned way. This is what I was talking about earlier. At places like the Fair Oaks Pharmacy and Soda Fountain in South Pasadena, California. Soda fountains probably hit prominence in the late 1800s. Yeah, I'm not going to South pa Pasadena. Where uh, soda jerks like myself would jerk on this handle where the name <laughs> soda jerk comes from and uh, carbonated water would dispense out. <laughs> <laughs> to heat up service. Shit, I'm a kid. Soda fountain disconnected <coughs> to the handles a few years back. And workers now take a modern approach when adding their carbonated water. <coughs> What's really significant about soda fountains oh, okay. is that you can add different flavors like cherry or vanilla, which were really popular um, in the old days and they're still popular now. Another popular choice served oh. here is one only your grandfather might remember. It's so green. The Ricky. This was originally an alcoholic beverage, but uh, the soda fountain kind of adopted to its own. So, simple ingredients, mix them together. Yeah, I am. <laughs> and this makes a lime ricky. There's also the phosphate. It contains an ingredient that works wonders as a rust remover. Great! There's a great! It's basically a lime ricky with the addition of phosphoric acid. Which gives it a sour kick, makes it a sour soda. And there's a lime phosphate. Give me that hard burn. New York favorite, the egg cream, which contains neither egg nor cream. It's basically milk, carbonated water, and then add some chocolate sauce. It's you want carbonated chocolate milk? <laughs> yeah, what? It, okay. It's a really pretty drink because the foam stays wide on top, while the rest of the drink gains a chocolate color. And you just mix it up like that, and you have an egg cream. And if you want a glass of plain old soda water, there's the two cent plane. Thanks for the it's follow. Welcome to the anymore, kitty kindle. But it's still a two cent plane. The only thing better than a visit <laughs> to a vintage soda fountain is the convenience of a fountain in your own home. No, I don't want a fountain in my own home. Soft drink lovers like Randy Olson are giving in to the temptation. You guys want straws? I put it in because I, I thought it was cool. I mean, I thought it was a really great thing to have a soda dispenser in my theater. When people come over, they, they walk into the theater, and the first thing they do is they look into the room, and they see the soda dispenser and go, 
why? <laughs> yeah, why? Well, yeah. When you sit down and watch a movie, you'll see why. It's it's a great thing to have. The components. Are this man is in a different tax bracket than me. He's got to be. Like, I have a theater, and I went and bought, like, a little foundries, and I buy the carbonation and the freaking syrup by the th it's got to be like it's got to be applied by soda bar system in wisconsin are identical to soda fountains at the 7-eleven or a movie theater only on a smaller scale all right one minute to movie time sit in your own movie theater and, and have fresh soda and popcorn and uh, hot dogs and enjoy a movie how does it get any better than that you think soft drinks in a movie are a blast this little piece of candy takes the term soda fountain to a whole new level. <laughs> Mentos. In a soft drink world dominated by Coke and Pepsi, <laughs> that it seems like it caters only to mainstream tastes, there's still room for a maverick. I used to drink Jones soda. Since 1987, Seattle based Jones soda has carved a small but significant niche in the industry with an unconventional approach. There's so many different like choices out there. We had to find a way to really, really connect with everyone in a unique way. Jones Soda makes a cola and root beer, but it's the eye-catching flavors like berry lemonade, strawberry lime, and blue bubble gum that draw curiosity. The blue bubble gum is pretty, it's pretty tasty. I like that. I used to to drink like the, one of the lemonades and like the blue bubble gum. They're like, they're like too sweet. I feel, but they're like really good. I would like do shaved ice and pour those in there instead of like a syrup. They're pretty good for that. But Jones really pushes the envelope in its holiday specialty packs flavors. Christmas ham. I'm trying <laughs> Christmas tree. It's like the woods here, but here we go. It's not bad. <laughs> Sweet potato soda. Uh, I don't think these are going to surpass colas. <laughs> he didn't like it. <laughs> I'm going to try. Oh! Oh! Make a soda taste like a ham? Don't! To solve that riddle, Jones turned to its business allies, the flavor uh. chemists at Virginia Dare Extract Company in Brooklyn. When I saw mm. it on paper, I kind of laughed. It was, it was surprising that somebody would want to drink something like this. I know. Using various chemical mm. compounds and years of experience, the chemists assemble a flavor formula to emulate each food's taste characteristics. A simple taste test helps ensure the formula's taste is as uh, close as possible I, to that uh, of the food. Here's liquid ham. The smoke is just right past the uh, meaty notes. So we did a good job. We did a good job. Okay. <laughs> He's just going oh, to town on it. Thing. Oh! I definitely got the, the aftertaste of the ham. Oh! I, I, no need for Thanksgiving or Christmas. No, this year, oh! But... Hard pass. With distinctive flavors. Another concept <sighs> individual to Jones is the way it labels its bottles. Foo -foo bear. People can send in a photograph of their favorite moment, and anybody has a chance to get on to a soda mm -hmm. bottle. You know, only Michael Jordan can get on Wheaties, but uh, anybody can get on a bottle of Jones. And if you want to guarantee your picture will make it onto a bottle... But fucking great. My Jones is a, is a very unique uh, process for Jones Soda. Upload a photo to the website, and uh, we'll send 12 bottles to their door, uh, whatever flavor they want, um, with their picture on it. In recent years, Jones Soda wedged its way into two soft drink markets once reserved only for the cola giants. The first, commercial airline beverage service, with its partner, Alaska Airlines. Oh, neat. The second, the Seattle Seahawks concession stand. Out of huh. all the NFL football teams uh, in the country, I think uh, 14 serve Pepsi, 16 serve Coke, and one serves Jones. That's, to produce a special pack of sodas tailor-made for football fans, Sweet victory. Jones once again tapped the expertise of the flavor chemists at Virginia Dare. Uh, they've asked us for a grass flavor and a dirt flavor. They... 
<laughs> they put that in like a crystal dish with a doily. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> they're like, let's ham it up for modern marvels. <laughs> and since smell and, and taste are so closely associated, everybody knows what grass and dirt smells like. So I tried to formulate flavors that smelled like these items rather than actually tasted mm. like them. Okay. Okay. Perspiration. I guess. It's quite unusual that you want to drink it, but there's a distinct odor to perspiration and we're able See. to emulate that with some of the compounds we Here, uh drink this that smells like sweat. I No just, no thanks. Sports cream and it's it's <laughs> Yo, yo, no, thank you. Hard pass. Look at it. It's like, look at it. <laughs> no, thanks. Have here. Well, that's God. nice. That, no, it's not. You kind of like, mm. It's actually a little difficult to drink. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I bet. When it comes to flavors meant to taste good. Christ. Jones means business as it produced six million cases in 2007. Oh, we definitely have the unique flavors, but I think any flavor that we put out, even if it is dirt, it's the best dirt you're gonna find in town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dirty. Uh, mm, that's not good. That's not good! <laughs> While Jones Soda sometimes pushes the limits of taste, a performance duo called Eepy Bird has pushed the Eepy limits Bird. of what a small piece of candy can ignite in a bottle of soda. The duo armed themselves with 200 liters of Diet Coke and 523 Mentos and took an offbeat science experiment, literally, to new heights. Their artistry became a viral video sensation, viewed by millions on the internet. Yeah, sure, why not? Some of the scientific artistry and anything. underlying the phenomenon are still a matter of debate. But for E.P. Bird's fans, at least, watching soft drinks explode can be almost as enjoyable. God, they as must be so sticky when they walk away from this. They must have so many ants. Like, so just many ants on that. 